All right, Tim here uh, from uh, Stream Native. I'm a developer advocate, and uh, my main technology is Apache Pulsar, as you saw there up in lights. Today, uh, my talk here at the Open Source Summit is uh, Hail Hydrate from Stream to Lake using open source. We're using Apache tools today, including Apache Pulsar, Apache NiFi, Apache Flink, and maybe some others along the way. I'm a developer advocate at Stream Native, and we support the open source Apache Pulsar. Uh, if you want to see more content from me, source code, articles, how to's, examples, go to one of my websites or to my GitHub. Lots of material there. I'll make sure all the slides, all the examples, everything you see today will be available for you to explore, build on. Uh, fork it if you want. Let's uh, interact on open source. A little more information there so you can find slides and other materials. Hopefully that's enough. Uh, let me do a quick agenda so you get an idea of what we're going to do today. We have about uh, 45 minutes or so, so we'll try to maximize what we can get out of there. I'll be on Slack. I'll be in different areas within the conference. I wish I was there in person. But today I'm here uh, virtually, but please reach out. I'm definitely interested to talk to you about uh, the different ways to populate a data lake with open source, along with a lot of other things that you could do pretty straightforward. So our use case today, how do I get data into a data lake or anywhere, you know, whether it's a lake house, just an S3 bucket, HBase, Kudu, you know, Aerospike, Cockroach DB, any database you have, any data lake, anything in the cloud, on premise, wherever it may be. That's what I'm doing here today. There's a number of challenges there. And uh, we'll go through their impact, a solution to them. What's our final outcome? And why did we pick uh, NiFi and Pulsar? Example, the architecture. And we'll walk through a quick demo. The use case is IoT ingestion. That's one. I'll show you some other formats of data. It really doesn't matter when you use the right open source tools. Everything's pretty straightforward. But right now we're starting off on our grand adventure. It looks like uh, a difficult problem. How do I get all this data? You know, high volume, lots of different sources, different formats, protocols, different vendors, devices. Lots of challenges here. Sometimes it seems like too much data to go through whatever channels you have, but relax, we have this. It will be pretty straightforward. So yeah, data ingestion is hard. You've got a lot of data, again, different formats, maybe very fast. You wanna be able to work on this data continuously real time, despite its speed, you need it as close to real time as you can get. And you wanna be able to see what's going on. If something's not working, something doesn't look like the data you expect, you wanna be able to get it real time, be able to consume it without any problems. Now, what impact does this have to you as a business, as you as a developer, your company, your project? Most people solve this by having a ton of different scripts. Maybe I've got a little Python over there, a shell script over here, some Java, some Scala, some Ruby, some Go, ton of things all over the place, maybe a cron job, maybe something's running in Google Cloud, something's in Amazon, maybe you've got something uh, stateless function over here, using a proprietary tool over there, maybe some legacy ETL. Code is everywhere, code sprawl is a real issue. Really hard to know what's running when, how do I change something? Do I keep things in sync? Not easy. Of course, this is uh, not just time, it's money. So the more you have to do that, the more you have to develop and maintain all these different scripts. Someone added a new source of data. Someone added a field. That's cost for development. You got to maintain it. You got a lot of tools. You may have to pay for support. Hard to find people who really know this technology out there. You may be waiting for new contractors. There may be delays as people have to learn yet another tool or a different package or language or protocol. A lot of money there. Obviously, this takes time. This is decrease the people who want this data. They don't care how you're getting it. 
They want to see it in their application. They want to see it in a dashboard. Could be a data scientist wants to see it in their notebook. You need that as fast as possible. This delays the rest of the project. If I don't have my data, you're losing revenue, you're losing opportunities, big deal here. So how do we do this? What's the solution? Apache NiFi is a good tool for getting all those different data sources, formats, protocols, different devices together. Again, NiFi is a piece of the puzzle. Apache Pulsar with its functions and different adapters makes some of this even easier. I can use the uh, MOP MQTT on uh, Pulsar to natively start streaming that in from all those devices that could push to MQTT. Obviously having a lot of different uh, data, different types, that's all supported with NiFi, makes it very easy. I'll show you XML, I'll show you JSON, doesn't really matter to NiFi and the other open source tools. NiFi gives you provenance, I see everything, makes it very easy. Now I can quickly add new applications regardless of the use case. Much shorter time frames. Don't have to wait for data. Data analysts, data scientists can just start innovating with that data. They don't have to wait around for months or years. We're saving money as well, not just time. So we don't have to worry about using consultants for too much time. Ingest is simplified. We're faster. We're more agile. We reduced uh, the time to onboard a new data source. Doesn't take weeks or days. You could probably get it hours. This is more data, more streams into your data warehouses now, regardless of where that's running. I recommend using what I call the flip stack. It's great for cloud data engineers, especially if you're doing uh, machine learning or anything around uh, data lakes, lake house, databases, data warehouses, whatever it is. So we support ton of different users, frameworks, languages, clouds, data sources, clusters, however you're doing it. Uh, most people are going to use these tools or cloud data engineers, probably know some ETL and ELT, maybe a little Python and Java, definitely doing some SQL, maybe done a little streaming, better know the basic cloud tools. That's a hefty order there. That is not simple. So these are very important people. Also, we've got cats out there. You might see them in my presentation. They're your typical user. They don't have a lot of coding skills. They're always questioning how much money I'm spending on all this. They are definitely experts in being uh, lazy. Often show up on my edge cameras. You'll see that. Also, the ever-present AI. Sometimes I need to run machine learning or deep learning as part of this ingest to uh, all these different clouds because may have to clean up the data while it's happening. I may need to run a process to determine what I should do with that data. Where does it go? Lots of different things here with machine learning. And I can run that in Apache NiFi, I can run that in a Pulsar functions, I can run in a function mesh, I can run that in Flink, I can run that in regular Pulsar clients and microservices. Again, lots of different places try to minimize it to just a, a few key areas that can be shared and distributed in some big clusters out there. Stream native makes this possible, you know, regardless of where you're running these apps. Again, they can be data pipelines, like it's the most common use case here for loading a data lake. And all those will be using our compute layer. What's nice with Apache Pulsar versus some other streaming and messaging technologies is, Compute and storage are separate, something pretty common in the cloud. So I can have my storage increased without having to add more computer, vice versa. I need more uh, support for additional clients, just add some more compute nodes. I don't need to add storage that I might not need there. And what makes the storage even better is Apache Bookkeeper can send that data as tiered storage. You don't have to write special scripts. You don't have to worry what happens if I run out of disk space. That's all managed for you. And that can go into S3 buckets or wherever you have your cloud storage. Where can I run this? Uh, very easily and cloud natively in Kubernetes, like most people like to run their apps these days. And also all the major clouds, as you'd expect. Stream native will run in your data center as well, or in any of your clouds natively. Makes it very easy. 
makes it a little simpler than having to uh, wire up all these open source projects on your own, which I'm doing today for demos. And you could certainly do that as a developer learning the product. But when you're ready to scale out in production, you need things like geo replication and backups and management. Uh, you probably need a host like Stream Native to help you. Again, we mentioned that Flip stack. Flip is also the name for Flink integrated with Pulsar. There's a bunch of great connectors that uh, Stream Native have put out into the open source to make it very easy for Flink and Pulsar to be friends. And we'll see that today. We talked about a lot of different open source technologies. One of them is NiFi. If you look at NiFi, you might see my name out there. I really love this project. Been working with it for like five, six years. You see I'm even wearing uh, the t-shirt out there in uh, Italy. I love it. I've got one of the devices that's streaming in data for us today. Why NiFi? Easily starts off on your laptop. You learn how to develop it. And then you could scale out as big as you need to be. It scales very linearly. Just keep adding nodes as big as you need to get. But you do some real-time streaming. This is great for acting as a kind of a universal gateway. Collect your data, curate it, analyze it, and start working on it right away. Maybe convert it, maybe limit it, send out alerts, send it to different things. I'll show you a bunch of examples there. A lot of features here. What's nice is lots of different sources and syncs. So you can kind of mix and match what you're doing here without writing code. You connect things together in a very uh, intelligent way. Underneath that, you've got abilities to guarantee delivery. Got provenance and lineage. You can see what's going on. Lots of different data sources supported. Great if you need to split or filter things. Really nice way to do it. Again, one good piece of the puzzle. The other one is uh, probably the most flexible way to do messaging and streaming is with Pulsar, which is a cloud native for distributed messaging and streaming, which are two different things. Uh, people tend to think of messaging, remember the old style messaging with JMS, MQ series, all those type of things. Those are still relevant practices. And then again, you've got the Kafka style event. Both of those are important. Pulsar supports both. So you don't have to have multiple different kind of messaging systems to achieve what you need. And here's some of those details that are important. Be able to do the pub sub that most people like to do. Have this geo replicated regardless of how many cloud availability zones you have. Being able to have functions. So you could do some of that to functionality before the events or messages are in their final destination, makes it very powerful. I highly recommend people do this. If you haven't been doing that already, please take a look at those. Multi-tenancy and more so than other places, because I've got namespaces and I've got the ability to break down all my topics into completely isolated areas that makes it easy to support you know, multiple lines of business or multiple companies on the same platform. Very powerful there. We mentioned that tiered storage, so we can make every topic persistent or we can not be, have it not be persistent. Again, that flexibility you don't see in other messaging systems. Full support for different connectors, so I could just stream that data right into Aerospike, into a JDBC data store, into ClickHouse, into a cockroach db and the mongo wherever it needs to go very easily full rest apis you could do any devops you need to do or even have nifi do those calls for you full command line interfaces so you could do everything you need to do from looking at the data starting and stopping things all those things you expect all that can be automated with your various devops tools as many clients as you could possibly think of there's support there, whether it's Python, .NET, Java, all of those are out there, Go. And they're very easy, clean APIs, nice way to do it. I'm not gonna get into the different subscription types, but as opposed to some of the other ones, there are multiple that let you decide how you wanna process things. So maybe you want to be able to move messages through as fast as possible, so I could have different consumers out there getting their own set of messages. 
So if I have 20 consumers, I could be doing things in 20x parallel. That might be a subscription type that's valuable to you. We got that right there. I mentioned that different protocol support. Obviously, we support the native Pulsar, but sometimes you have existing apps, especially in IoT, that are doing MQTT. You might be doing AMQP, JMS, Kafka. I don't want to have to rewrite all those clients. You don't have to. As you add new ones, yeah, make them native Pulsar. But for now, have them do their native MQTT protocol and have Pulsar act as the broker there and just make that come in and you don't have to worry about it. I'll show you a couple different protocols and it doesn't, it doesn't add any complexity to what you're doing. It's very nice. So let's go here. My example is I've got a device over here. I've also got some a weather API call and I've got uh, another REST call. Bring that into NiFi to do that initial cleanup for preparation. Get that into Pulsar, whether that's through MQTT, native, Kafka, however. Flink is going to do some SQL fun on that as those events come in. And then that data is available in your data lake for whoever needs to query it, make dashboards, apps, whatever you're doing. Just a little more detail on that. Again, whether I'm pushing to MQTT or I'm pushing uh, to whatever different protocol you like, it natively goes to Pulsar, very easy. Data coming off this device, pretty straightforward JSON, but we'll show you how easy it is to work with that. This is one of my cats. We'll also do weather data. Again, what's interesting in weather data, this is coming in as a zip file of a lot of XML files, and we'll show you how easy that is to parse. Please connect with me, learn more about Pulsar, I've been coming uh, extremely excited about it. It's one of the uh, most interesting new projects out there in Apache. You're just starting to see it everywhere. It makes things a lot easier and solves some of the problems that people have been having with streaming. Got links to a bunch of different source code, bunch of different examples. Please reach out to me. But uh, now that we've done you know, the slides, everyone needs to see some slides. Let's show some real code. This is my favorite part. That's so I kind of get through the slides as quick as we can. Wanted to set up those basics and give you something to return to later. If you want to get a refresher, it is a good uh, stored document for you to look at. But really, the fun part is, let's look at live code. Now, this is Apache NiFi. This is consuming from Pulsar and consuming from Kafka. Under the covers, that's the same Pulsar cluster. I just have both protocols enabled just to show you how easy that is. I'm going to start data coming in from my device. I'm SSH'd into my IoT device. Again, if, just to show you the Python code here, really basic, but it's grabbing some sensors, doing a little formats and calculations, and it's going to send it to two different Pulsar uh, topics. And it's doing it, one of them through MQTT and one through Kafka. Again, using those native libraries there, there's nothing Pulsar specific there. It's just sending Kafka messages and it's just producing MQTT messages. The only difference being that this cluster here is a Pulsar cluster and it's listening on these two protocols and more. So we have that running. Just want to show you some of that command line. Here's the different topics on that cluster. And you'll see we're going to be using a couple of them. You saw one of them was pushing to this one. One of them was pushing to uh, Kafka. You know, behind the scenes, these are the Pulsar topics for them. Let's take a look here back in NiFi. As we see some data is coming in, because I started that uh, IoT process again, we can see the latest data here. And we could see lots of the details. This is that lineage. This is that provenance information that lets you know what's going on with every event that comes in, gives it a unique ID, tells you the size, tells you where it is. Like here, you could see where it came from, right down to the topic, bunch of different attributes, one message. And we could even dive into the content to see that. 
and I could store this somewhere if I want a record of everything that came in. But just to give you an idea of the different sensor readings coming in. So those were consumed by Pulsar. I'm going to uh, treat it as JSON, convert it into JSON. I could have decided to convert that into another format, which is another thing that uh, NIFI does really easy. Maybe it's Avro. Maybe I need a comma separated value for some of my data scientists. Maybe I need to build a form, text form, maybe Parquet, maybe XML, whatever it happens to be. Here I'm writing a query on that data real time. I just want to couple the fields if the humidity is over 45%. This one, just give me all the data. What's nice here, as you saw, I stopped that data real time in between each step. I've got a configurable queue with built-in back pressure, built-in load balancing strategies, ability to prioritize different events. Really powerful, again, all graphical. We could see a bunch of the data has come through as alerts. Some have come through as standard uh, data. And here I'm just gonna send it to my cloud database. But just to give you uh, an idea what's going on here, looks pretty familiar. It is that same data. Here, I'm just going to start pushing that to a uh, cloud data store. Pretty easy, not, to, not that hard. Uh, we just wrote uh, 78 records there, and I could see the results of them. What happened? You know what? Uh, what happened? You know what? Where that data went? What's cool is if you look at this uh, code to uh, write to uh, a Postgres database in the, in the cloud, which could have been ClickHouse, could have been any JDBC store. I said it was an insert. I said it was JSON. There's the table name. That's it. <laughs> There's no other difficulties there. That's how easy it is to uh, send that data to the cloud. I didn't have to worry about any uh, complex things really easy. So we're writing to that cloud database. Again, it could be Dremio, it could be uh, Databricks, Snowflake, ton of different databases I could be writing to in any cloud, anywhere that happens to be. Let's take a look right here. I pushed that into uh, a PostgreSQL database and you could see these are the recent records that came in it's in a regular database. I can bring this into a dashboard, bring this into anything that reads from databases. Pretty straightforward. That's the entire process to take a stream from various devices, make it validated and clean, send it up to a cloud data lake. It's ready for use. That's it. Now I said we can also use other protocols. Here's Kafka. Again, this is my laptop. Same Pulsar cluster, use the native Kafka port, again, using those Kafka protocols, read from that topic that we were pushing into. If we looked at our app here, here is that Kafka topic. It's our Pulsar topic. And say I wanna read the earliest one, put my group ID, standard Kafka. Didn't have to change anything. Data comes in doesn't matter that it was in Pulsar. I could see the different attributes that came in, uh, Kafka offsets, keys, all those things you expect in Kafka. It's just there. Let's show you another app. So that's one you know, IoT app running. I can also get data from a REST endpoint. This one is for stocks. So what's interesting is it comes in a kind of a weird format. So I want to break it out. It gives me one big JSON file with a bunch of header stuff I don't care about and a bunch of values over time. So I just pull out those values. Then I convert it into a schema that I like. Then I'm going to add a unique ID and add a timestamp and a date and time and then get it ready. I want to just work on one record at a time. Not if I let me work at thousands at a time if I wanted, but to make the uh, demo not run too fast so you can't see it, 
you know, you click a button and all of a sudden 50,000 records are gone. I put a control rate here. So we just do 20 a second, just so you could see data coming through, makes it look a little cleaner. And here I'm just pushing those records into Pulsar and you could see them coming out. No failures here. I could retry if something's down. Again, pretty straightforward. I connect to my local Pulsar. Let me show you that. Here is where you'd have your login and authentication if you were connecting to something like Stream Native. Here it's just on my laptop, pretty straightforward. Go into all the defaults, default ports. Makes it easy for development for me. This is pushing to stocks. So I've got data going into the stocks Pulsar topic, just so we could see that happen. And I've got that controlled. So we'll just keep getting more and more data in there. Pretty straightforward, but makes it easy for you to see that. And to show you, it's not going nowhere. I'm gonna read it. Here's my consumer. Here, I've got a little query. This could be anything I want. Maybe just limit the data. But again, just to show you that it's running, data is coming through there. So that's stocks. So we saw IoT data, we saw REST stock data. What's next? Well, how about some weather? Uh, I like to know the weather. The weather's been pretty rough recently. We've had some flooding, we've had uh, hurricanes. You know, this is something you need to keep an eye on. So this one here, I wanna know the weather for the entire United States. Well, fortunately the uh, NOAA has put all that in one file. Now, most people would just manually go there, download this zip file, uh, then uncompress that, then unzip it, get me a ton of different files. Well, those are all XML. And some of them are weird. I don't want any weird, I just want airports. I wanna know the weather at every airport in the United States. And I certainly don't want XML. I'm not a fan of XML. So XML, convert that to JSON and get rid of anyone to have a weird location because I want to know that this is at a place. You know, I want this to know this is Newark Airport. This is, you know, the airports all around the country. I want to know their weather. That one's important for me, especially for business travel, for different applications I have, just those. And here, again, like we did before, I'm going to do a split and control so I don't run 5,000 records in a second. Doesn't make for a good demo to see all your data go through in a second. And running on my laptop, I put a few hundred gigs of data here. Uh, I'm gonna have a lot of deleting to do. So I didn't wanna do that. So we see here data coming through and we get all this metadata. Some of this could be really important to you. So I can, and if I pull out every one of those fields, Maybe put that in another Pulsar topic and use it for something else. Like this was the original file name, you know, which airport it came from, you know, interesting data where they ran the, the NOAA servers, all that sort of information is there for me. And I'm just going to push this to a weather topic. Pretty straightforward. Now I've documented how to do all these demos from the NIFI side, from the uh, Pulsar side, from MQTT, ton of the source code here. How do you create uh, the topics? Really easy. How do you do a list? How do you consume data? How do you test it? You know, I put data in, I want to get data out. Like, uh, you know, here I can consume some of that IoT data. Pretty straightforward, consume. On that one, I created a, a uh, a subscription there so that my command line gets just his data that he wants. And you can see there was one of the IoT records just to give you an idea. So we have that data coming in pretty straightforward. Let's do the flink part. Now I got data into topics and I can pull data out of topics. Very helpful. Sometimes I want to do other things. Certainly I can run a Pulsar function. So when that event arrives, something happens. Maybe I put it into another topic. Lots of different things I could do there, including like I mentioned, machine learning or deep learning or any kind of uh, functions or processing you need to do. But something I like to do is create a table on those event streams as they're coming in. We do that, there's 
large scale as I want. Fortunately, Apache Flink, another great open source project, lets me do that. So the, the syntax is really easy. I could have used the built-in catalog that looks at all the Pulsar topics and does it for me. Cloud native, um, stream native, and uh, Apache Pulsar have that built-in schema registry. And you can see that very easily in the cloud. But we don't need to do that. It's very cool if you wanna be able to control what that table looks like, just the fields you want, control things like, when do you start grabbing those messages? All those sort of information, it was JSON, all those connectors are here. So we're gonna create a table and then we'll start uh, querying them. Pretty straightforward, but I think that's important. So I mentioned uh, the schema registry. I don't want to gloss over that. And sh let's show you what a schema looks like. So with uh, Stream Native Cloud, I could see that schema. What's cool is I built this up with an app. Pretty easy for me to define this based on the fields in my class. Again, if you want to write code, you can definitely do that. It makes it pretty clean. Uh, support a couple different types of schemas here. This is a JSON schema, pretty straightforward, but it makes it very easy to be able to de develop and see what's going on in my, uh, in my topics. I have a schema on it. Also lets me do uh, queries. If, if you have a schema, you can query them. This is just a different way to see the data. Stream Native makes it pretty easy. Again, you could do this from the command line. There are some built-in utilities with Pulsar. But having it cloud hosted and managed and all that done for you with nice interfaces makes it a little easier. Just a heads up on that. So we were in here. So we're going to create a table. Let's uh, create this SCADA table. Let's see which one, version I like. Let's do earliest. Let's make sure we grab it. We're going to copy it. Go into my Flink. Let me make sure I didn't create this table already. This is the uh, table I have. These are the different catalogs. I'm in the default one where it lets me create my own. So I created a table for weather already. Let's describe weather. Let's describe uh, SCADA 2, which is a different version of this table. Let's describe stocks. So you can see the tables are there. Let's build a new one. Just pasting that in there. Let's make sure that SCADA was built properly. And I'm just gonna do a very simple select star. Not the most uh, exciting one, but keep it simple. You see, I've got a, all the SQL syntax to create a couple of different tables here. Some of them I've built already. One I just wanted to show you. So I could do stocks, uh, weather, all the different ones. And some couple of different uh, things to make it a little easier for you. Pretty straightforward. So the query's running. What's cool is as you see that line pop up, that is a new event that just made it into the topic. So as that IoT app is sending data, I can continuously get it. So my SQL just keeps running. And as a new record comes in, I get it. Now here, I'm just looking at the data. I'm just developing what I want to do in the SQL. From here, I can add an insert statement, insert that into another topic. So say I wanna do alerts, someone could be consuming, waiting on that topic to do whatever they need to do, which is pretty powerful. Also, what you can do is have that set up in Pulsar to be a sync. So when I push to a Pulsar topic, I can have that connected to a sync for say S3 or for ClickHouse or Aerospike or CockroachDB or um, you know, well, a lake house, wherever it may be, ton of different connectors for Pulsar. So if I send an alert to that topic, it'll automatically go into that uh, sync, makes it real easy. Another way to do this without code. So I just write it here and have uh, Flink do what uh, it needs to do. Let's just take a look at uh, the tables here. Like if we wanted to take a look at uh, weather, we can look at the weather one and then figure out, 
Let's insert that to somewhere else. Let's just show a couple of fields. And if I come up with a query that I really like, I can take that, embed that in an app, and then app could do other kind of processing. Again, I could do some of that processing in NiFi. I could do some of that in uh, Pulsar Functions. Lots of different options there. Depends on what you want to do. So we still have that guy running. Uh, we could get some more data for uh, for weather. As you see, we already passed through all that weather data, even though that was all the weather forecast for the whole country. And we'll just start add a couple more here. As you see, a couple thousand uh, new reports coming in. And even with this delay here that I purposely added, it, it processes in them pretty fast. Oh, may have run out of uh, disk space there. Something that happens when you're running uh, Pulsar, Flink, NiFi, and this whole uh, presentation on the same machine. You know, sometimes it's better to uh, run everything in the cloud and then uh, come back and, <laughs> you know, run it distributed, but you never know with the networks, you know, the fun things that happen when you're speaking at conferences. You know, it's probably always best to run locally in case networks are down. You know, even though the uh, cloud hosting may never go down, networks do. Uh, I think I may have run out of memory here. So we'll uh, show you that this is running locally. Uh, I'm going to stop the cluster here. And uh, this is my Flink cluster. So one node cluster on my laptop, and then I'm going to, uh, I restarted it. Hopefully I got enough RAM on my machine. That's the syntax to run a SQL client. So you can get access to all those different things that you uh, want to do there. I'm just going to create one table just to show you again how we do it. We'll get over to our shell here. Let's make sure the table is created. I'm going to select star from the weather, or I could pick just a couple of fields. Again, that's up to you what makes sense on uh, how you want to do that, uh, those queries. I might stop this guy because pushing in a lot of data over here, and this is all running on the same machine. What's nice with NiFi is I could start and stop whenever I want. This is stock data again. Haven't been doing anything with it, so maybe I can uh, just stop that for now. And we'll just focus on the weather. Again, only have a couple of hundred records left, even at processing uh, 20 a second. That goes pretty quick. Again, that's why I put that delay on there. Otherwise, you're not getting any records. As you see here, I've already pushed a lot of weather data here, even how many that's showing on the page. You see here, we're on page 250 of the data. So there, there's already a lot of data in this topic. And you can see airports all over the world. We'll see if we get to the last one yet. We could just go in here and we could see all the records. Ooh, that's pretty cold. Where is that? That's a little nicer weather than I have here in New Jersey. Oh, Montana, that's pretty nice weather. Yeah, so you can see some of these, there's a couple of them where they haven't gotten reports in a while. You can see those observation times. Anyone that's September 3rd, that's pretty recent. You know, and you can see the lat long, pretty hot there in Arizona. Just to give you an idea. So maybe I want to, uh, now that I examine the data, I'm going to send this to a data scientist and they tell me, Tim, I'm interested in a geofenced area so we could do some math on the lat long. Give me that area. And I want every record that comes in, you know, ignore things when the observed time is in the past. You can put that in the query. Just show me where the Celsius temperature is over 20. Sure, we could do that. We just put that in the select, have that happen, do an insert, put that into another topic. Now you have your data ready to go. Pretty straightforward. That just gives you some of the idea of what you can do. Now, if I want to send new data, and now the one thing with this forecast, with this weather data, this is the live weather. Every 15 minutes is the general collection time. So running this back to back, 
not going to get new data. I've set my system up to not care that I get duplicates. Again, you know, that's up to you what your data looks like. You could filter uh, duplicates very easily in different spots. As you see here, the data is coming in really quickly into my Flink query. It's very straightforward. I could have limited it to, you know, say certain locations, a wild card on location, you know, something like uh, location. How about where clause? Where location like, uh, say, uh, New Jersey. That's where I am. And we just get those in. Makes it a little, little easier. Again, we still have data coming in. And it uh, goes pretty quick. By the time we load this, it won't be there. <laughs> it's one of the uh, problems with running these things. They move so quickly. That's why you might want to look at the... Uh, the provenance to see what's going on with my data. And I could see here what airport that is. And uh, if without even diving into the uh, body of the data, you have all that metadata. So we got most of that data and we might've got New Jersey. Yeah, we did. You could see here, we got two pages in New Jersey. I could see the airports nearest to me. I could see uh, pretty much all the airports in the state. We don't have a ton of them. You know, Atlantic City, you can take a look at that one. What's the weather down there by the uh, beach, 77? That's not bad. So, you know, you can see what's going on, run queries however you want, just pick the fields you wanted. So maybe I just wanted uh, location, lat long, temperature, you know, maybe uh, humidity, you know, wind speed, those sort of things. You just pick and choose the ones you want pretty straightforward. You know, I could have picked it from other parts of the uh, country, or I could have put a join in there, joined it with another uh, topic that makes sense, did some lookups. You get the idea here. We're running low on time. Hopefully you'll uh, want to talk to me, ask some questions. We'll do that, uh, you know, during the live session. Thanks for attending. I'm hoping You've learned some uh, cool stuff you could do with various streaming tech within uh, the open source. You're not limited by, you know, anything other than the needs you have, the use case, and uh, the time to do some basic setup. As I, as you see here, data keeps coming in. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference.